Life is confusing when you're 16 years old and you just got your braces taken off and you're in love with the girl. Being young and in love for the first time should be all flowers and sunshine, movie theater makeouts and sweaty handholding, but for me it was genuinely terrifying. Most teenagers have someone to go to when they need a little advice and direction, but I didn't have that privilege. I couldn't go to my traditional Christian parents with bisexual identity crisis and say, hey mom and dad, I like a girl, what do I do now? That would have been infinitely more frightening than figuring it out on my own. And as a young adult, I was resolved to figure it out on my own. Even though my girlfriend and I had been dating for five months, it felt like I hadn't fully committed to the job yet. I hadn't fully embraced being a lesbian. I looked at the committed lesbians in my life, one aunt from my dad's side and the other from my mom's, and I just felt different, like I was doing it all wrong. My dad's sister, Raquel, later aptly named Rocky, is butch. She's a large woman covered in shitty tattoos of her ex-lover's names. She has a serious buzz cut and always brags about her mind-blowing cunnilinga skills. As a 16-year-old, I had no idea what constituted mind-blowing cunnilingus, but things change. My other aunt, named Michelle, is the epitome of lipstick lesbian, the exact opposite of Rocky. Pretty, done up, and feminine, like really feminine. And although they're at opposite ends of the spectrum, they're both involved in typical lesbian relationships, where one girl is the guy and one girl is the girl. My 16-year-old self was taken aback by this concept. I wasn't committing my life to being a real lesbian, and damn it, I was determined to change that. Where did I fit in with my big boobs and girly dresses and gorgeous Latina girlfriend with long brown hair and a huge ass? We were two lipstick lesbians, and we were not following the typical conventions of lesbian living, according to my aunts. But we did adhere to certain lesbian motifs, such as one top, one bottom. I was the top for sure. That still counted even if my girlfriend was four inches taller than me and could crush me with her bare hands, right? I was lost. My girlfriend and I desperately needed people like us to look up to. As baby lesbians, we needed to be represented somewhere, anywhere, so we didn't feel alone. And because we didn't know anyone personally, we looked to the media for answers. That's where Tegan and Sarah, God bless their lesbian souls, came in. Here were two young women who loved other women, and they were hot, really, really hot. Boom, perfect role models. My love for Tegan and Sarah was at an all-time high in the summer of 2007. I owned every album ever made and knew the lyrics to every obscure song they regretted writing in high school. I loved them with a burning passion. I devoured every live version of So Jealous YouTube had to offer, ensnared by the intensity of their voices and chiseled jawlines. Anytime Walking with the Ghost played on the radio, you could bet your ass I was blasting it for all to hear. I had no shame. I knew these girls, like old friends separated by distance, but never by heart. They weren't just the two lesbian singer-songwriter twins from Canada who were slowly changing the world. They were my best friends, Titi and Sasa. <laughs> this unhealthy obsession with TNS was shared with my girlfriend. It was actually more of a competition based on who could buy the most albums and know the most personal facts more than it was a sweet little hobby we shared. It was like the more we knew about Tegan and Sarah, the more we acquired lesbian powers. And I wanted to have all the lesbian powers. I wanted to be the fucking <laughs> Dumbledore of lesbianism. But alas, my queer magic was weak, and my girlfriend was strengthening her lesbian powers by the second with her high top vans, rainbow socks, and recent discovery of the Indigo Girls. <laughs> I had to do something to get my identity straight. I mean, gay. But unfortunately, 
I was all out of ideas. That is, until I decided to turn once more to the two patron saints of Cunnilingus, the beloved Tegan and Sarah. One look at them and I knew. I knew what I had to do. I saw it on top of Tegan's head like a shining halo, like divine intervention in the form of a fashionable mullet. Her hair was the answer to all of my troubles. If my girlfriend wasn't going to be my boyfriend, I was going to be my girlfriend's boyfriend. <laughs> this was going to be the thing that got me all the lesbian kudos. I printed out a Google photo of Tegan's glorious mane that very day, which could only be described by me as perfection and described by my mother as please God no. <laughs> My hair was so long at the time, running down the middle of my back, wavy and absolutely gorgeous. It was the envy of every girl in my class, but it had to go. I took the hair photo to the salon three days later and brought my mother along, who was an uncomfortable mix of fury and sorrow. But I felt no sympathy for my poor mom. I wanted her there to witness my lesbian insurrection. I looked my mother straight in the eye as I told the hairstylist, do it. I could practically feel the hairstylist shiver with fear. I couldn't blame her, though, with all the disapproving huffs of my mother echoing in the background. Hell yeah! Anarchy! Freedom! <laughs> fuck everyone! These were the chants I heard in my head as the hairstylist chopped inches and inches off my head. They fell to the floor, heavy and dead. And six inches later, I felt light, airy, as if a huge lesbian weight had been lifted off my burdened shoulders. This was liberation. How come no one had told me a haircut could solve both a sexual and existential crisis at the same time? <laughs> I was joyous, over the moon. My cheeks hurt from all the smiling. I skipped. <laughs> I spent the rest of the day catching glimpses of myself in mirrors and windows, marveling at my newfound lesbianism. This was real. I was committed. I looked like an adorable little boy, B-O-I, with my short hair, striped t-shirt, and Converse shoes. When I woke up the next day for school and looked into my closet, I was suddenly blinded by the overabundance of pastel tops and flower print skirts. I had never realized how feminine I was until I had a haircut that prevented me from being so. I gazed at those outfits longingly as I reached for a pair of faded jeans and a flannel instead. I wanted my old clothes back, badly, but I didn't think it would look right with my new hair and sexual identity. I went to school with high expectations. My friends were going to love my new haircut. Their acknowledgement of my lesbian commitment was all I needed to feel truly comfortable with myself. And after that, I'd never doubt who I was again. But when I got to school and hardly anyone commented on my mullet, it hit me. I wasn't comfortable with the new me. My new hair and clothes didn't give me lesbo confidence. It didn't change who I was on the inside. When it came down to it, I still didn't know who I was. My girlfriend liked my hair. I didn't believe her, though. We were falling apart fast. We stopped kissing and writing each other heart-shaped love notes. She started looking at other girls, and I? I started looking at boys. Boys with actual penises, not the plastic ones that run off Duracell. <laughs> I was losing my mind along with my gayness, too. I ached for the old me in cowboy boots and pretty dresses, the me with wild hair and a wild heart. She seemed to have a better idea of who she was than I did. When my girlfriend and I finally broke up two years after my catastrophe of a haircut, it was because we genuinely hated each other. <laughs> she said it was because I'd never be able to fully commit to a woman, that I was just a kinky straight girl who simply enjoyed banging women but never truly loving them. But I was sure I loved her, even if it lasted as long as my haircut did. Vamp first timer, Vanessa Zarate! <laughs>